Skydia.com is advancing towards special video series, where we are specifically covering major aspects of pharmacology. Watch out for more subject-related series very soon on Skydia.com. Whenever normally you experience pain, which analgesic or which medicine do you prefer? Are you thinking about paracetamol? Well, it's not just you. Acetaminophen, or more commonly known as paracetamol, is the most commonly taken analgesic worldwide. And not only that, it is recommended as a first-line therapy in pain conditions by the World Health Organization. Now, acetaminophen is often misinterpreted as a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or NSAID. Well, this is because acetaminophen has some NSAID-like properties. For example, it is antipyretic, or it means that it reduces fever. It has analgesic properties, means that it relieves pain. But it lacks the anti-inflammatory properties as it doesn't reduce inflammation. An anticoagulative activity is also lacking. That means that it doesn't prevent blood clotting. Now, all these properties are commonly associated with these drugs. So it is not considered to be an NSAID. Acetaminophen is basically an N-acetyl P-aminophenol. Now, as the name suggests, it contains a phenol with an amino group at the para position and an acetyl group attached with the nitrogen of the amino group. Now, acetaminophen is the active metabolite of phenacetin. Now, what is this drug, phenacetin? But remember that phenacetin is a prodrug that is metabolized to acetaminophen. But it's more toxic than its active metabolite and has no rational indications. Well, it was actually banned in most countries from the late 1960s because it causes renal diseases and cancers of the upper urinary tract. So moving forward, let's talk about acetaminophen in more detail. We're going to talk about its mechanism of action, its therapeutic uses, its pharmacokinetics, and we'll also go in de into detail about the adverse effects and the toxic reactions it causes inside the body. So stay tuned. Hi there. Now before we jump into the video, I have a very important question for you. Have you subscribed to our channel? If not, then subscribe right now to stay updated with the latest and brand new Skadia.com lectures. And click on the bell icon to stay notified about new releases. We upload a full lecture every single week with some short videos sprinkled in between. So that being said, now that you've subscribed, let's return to the lecture. Well, actually, the exact mechanism of action of acetaminophen has not been fully established. Well, despite this, it is often categorized alongside NSAIDs due to its ability to inhibit the cyclooxygenase or the COX pathways. Well, it is thought to exert central actions which ultimately lead to the alleviation of pain symptoms. One theory is that acetaminophen increases the pain threshold by inhibiting the COX. Now, wait a minute. Do you remember what is cyclooxygenase responsible for? Well, let's recall that cyclo cyclooxygenase is also known as prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase, or PTGS. It is an enzyme that is responsible for the formation of prostanoids, including thromboxane and prostaglandins. Now, these originate from arachidonic acid, which is actually a polyunsaturated fatty acid present in the phospholipid of membranes of the body's cells. So what is acetaminophen doing? It's actually inhibiting the two isoforms of cyclooxygenases, COX-1 and COX-2, that are involved in the prostaglandin synthesis. Now what are, you must be wondering, what are prostaglandins? Well, you are already familiar that prostaglandins are responsible for eliciting pain sensations. So we can relate the inhibition of its synthesis with the analgesic activity of acetaminophen. Remember that acetaminophen does not inhibit cyclooxygenase in the peripheral tissues and therefore it has no peripheral anti-inflammatory effects. Now, although acetylsicylic acid or aspirin is an irreversible inhibitor of COX, 
and it directly blocks the active site of the enzyme. But studies have shown that acetaminophen or paracetamol blocks the COX indirectly. Now, there are some other studies that actually suggest that acetaminophen crosses the blood-brain barrier and selectively blocks a variant type of the COX enzyme, which is referred to as COX-3. Now, this will block the formation and release of prostaglandins in the central nervous system. Now, this inhibits the direct action of endogenous pyogens on the heat-regulating centers in the brain, that is, hypothalamus. Now, this results in the peripheral vasodilation, sweating, and loss of body heat that is resulting in its antipyretic effect. Now, if we talk about the therapeutic uses of acetaminophen, this drug is useful in mild to moderate pain, such as headaches, myalgia, postpartum pain, menstrual periods, toothache, and may also be used in colds or sore throats and reactions to vaccinations and to reduce fever overall. Moreover, it is suitable for the substitute of the analgesic and antipyretic effects of aspirin, especially for those patients with gastric complaints, like the one with a history of peptic ulcer disease, and those in whom prolongation of bleeding time would be disadvantage, like people with hemophilia and those who do not require the anti-inflammatory action of aspirin. It is preferred to administer acetaminophen rather than aspirin in patients in which aspirin precipitates the bronchospasm. Remember that acetaminophen is the analgesic or antipyretic of choice for children with viral infections like chickenpox. Well, it is because aspirin may trigger Ray's syndrome, which is a rare disorder that causes brain and liver damage. Now, it usually occurs in children who have recent viral infections, such as, like I said, chickenpox or the flu. Now, acetaminophen may also be used in patients with gout who are taking uricosauric agents like probenicid or sulfenpyrazone drugs. As acetaminophen does not antagonize these agents, while on the other hand, aspirin reduces the efficacy of these drugs. So this is why acetaminophen is more preferred in these cases. Now talking about the dosage of acetaminophen, it is usually administered orally as a tablet or capsule in adults and in forms of syrup or oral solution or suspension for children. Now other routes such as intravenous as well as rectal suppository are available for both adults and pediatric patients. Now moving on to the proper dosage of this drug, in adults, acute pain and fe fever may be effectively treated with almost 325 to 500 milligrams four times daily. And it is now recommended not to exceed four grams per day in most cases. Now on the other hand, in children, the dosage is 10 to 15 milligrams per kg per dose. This is usually given orally every four to six hours and must not exceed more than five doses or 2.6 grams in 24 hours. And in the case of hepatic impairment, we should try to avoid acetaminophen as much as possible. Or if it is used, therapy should be limited to short-term use at doses not to exceed two grams per day. The use of normal doses during pregnancy are not associated with the increased risk of miscarriage or stillbirth. However, in the case of maternal overdose, increase in the fetal death or spontaneous abortion may be seen if treatment is delayed. Wheezing and asthma in early childhood is also associated with frequent maternal use of drug during pregnancy. If we talk about lactation, this drug is usually excreted in milk. But in general, breastfeeding is accepted if the relative infant dose is less than 10%. And breastfeeding must be avoided when this relative dose increases to more than 25%. Like I told you earlier, acetaminophen is administered orally and its absorption is related to the rate of gastric emptying. At the peak, blood concentrations are usually reached within 30 to 60 minutes. 
Acetaminophen is slightly bound to plasma proteins, so it means that it is well distributed. A significant first pass metabolism occurs in the luminal cells of the intestine and in the hepatocytes. Now, under normal circumstances, acetaminophen is conjugated in the liver to form inactive glucuronidated or sulfated metabolites. A portion of acetaminophen is hydroxylated to form N acetyl benzoaminoquinone, or it is also known as N acetyl parabenzoquinone amine, or NAPQI. It is a highly reactive and potentially dangerous metabolite. And this toxic metabolite, in the setting of large toxic doses of acetaminophen, reacts with the sulfhydryl groups in the hepatic cell proteins and it forms a substance that causes cell death and damages the liver. Now on the other hand, at normal doses of acetaminophen, the N-acetylbenzoaminoquinone reacts with the sulfhydryl group of glutathione and it ultimately forms a non-toxic substance. Now after all of this has occurred, acetaminophen and all its metabolites are then excreted in the urine. What about the half-life of acetaminophen? Well, the half-life is two to three hours, and it is relatively unaffected by the renal function. Now with toxic doses or liver disease, the half-life may increase twofold or even more. Now remember with normal therapeutic doses, acetaminophen is virtually free of any significant adverse effects. However, in some rare cases, we may observe a skin rash and minor allergic reactions may also occur infrequently. There may be minor altercations in the leukocyte count, but these are generally transient. Now, hemolytic anemia and methemoglobinemia are very rare adverse events. Now, hemolytic anemia is a disorder in which red blood cells are destroyed faster than they can be made. Now, this destruction of red blood cells is called hemolysis. Now, as red blood cells carry oxygen to all parts of your body, so if a patient has a lower than normal amount of red blood cells, he may suffer from anemia. Now, on the other hand, methemoglobinemia occurs when red blood cells contain methemoglobin at levels higher than 1%. Now, you must be wondering, what is methemoglobin? Well, it usually results from the presence of iron in the ferric form instead of the usual ferrous form. And this results in a decreased availability of oxygen to the tissues. Uh, okay, now moving on to the other ADRs or adverse reactions. Remember that renal tubular necrosis is a rare complication of prolonged large dose therapy. And as mentioned earlier, large dose therapy actually depletes the glutathione in the liver. Now this leaves an acetyl benzoaminoquinone to react with the sulfhydryl groups of the hepatic proteins. This ultimately leads to hepatic necrosis, which is a very serious and potentially life-threatening condition. The early symptoms of hepatic damage include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Especially patients with hepatic disease, viral hepatitis, or history of alcoholism are at a higher risk of acetaminophen-induced hepatotoxicity. Remember that acetaminophen overdose may be manifested by renal tubular necrosis, hypoglycemic coma, and also thrombocytopenia. Now, sometimes as a result, liver necrosis can occur as well as liver failure. The requirement of a liver transplant and death may also occur. Now, it is important to remember that the toxic effects are not caused by acetaminophen alone, but they're also attributed to an acetyl parabenzoquinone amine, or NAPQI, or NAPQI, as it is sometimes, sometimes called. Now, this is a toxic metabolite released in the CYP2E1 pathway. So what do we have to do in the case of acetaminophen toxicity? Well, we have to administer an acetylcysteine, which contains sulfhydryl groups to which the toxic metabolite can bind. And it can be life-saving if it is administered within 10 hours of the overdose. 
But this agent should be avoided in patients with severe hepatic impairment, as I've been telling you over and over again. And the periodic monitoring of liver enzyme tests is also recommended for those on high dose acetaminophen. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this lecture. We talked about acetaminophen in great detail. So next time when you take paracetamol, you'll remember what exactly goes on inside your body. For more such videos and for, in, for more informative lectures, keep watching scatty.com. So that was all for today. Remember, we upload full lectures every week. But for more content, you can visit our website, scalia.com. We have exciting new lectures waiting for you. So go visit and happy learning.